listen to various perspectives on sustainability related issues relevant to Illinois. Today we are focusing on sustainability as it relates to agricultural plastics. I'm pleased to welcome today's speaker, Roger Springman, who is currently an agricultural plastics consultant. He was previously director of recycling programs and network development at Genesis Poly Recycling in Mankato, Minnesota. Prior to that, he was the Clean Sweep Program Manager at the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, where he managed the state's hazardous waste and drug collection program. He has also at various points in his career researched improved ways of managing wastes, conducted outreach, and has been involved in environmental planning. He is also the past president and co-founder of the Pesticide Stewardship Alliance. Before we get started, a couple of housekeeping points. Restrooms are in the hallway across the reception and through the door to my right. And in case of an emergency, please stand up and follow my instructions. With that, Roger, thank you for being here. Thank you, Kishor. Um, I've been here about an hour, and over the past hour, I've had the good fortune of running into some uh, researchers and scientists who are very interested in what I'm doing, which I think is fantastic. And I can tell you from my perspective as a Michigan State graduate, had I known that you were here decades ago when I was at Michigan State, I would have come here. Because I like what you're doing. You, 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 I, Kishor just took me on a tour of your uh, guest center uh, library area where he went reviewed the many projects, and I was most impressed. And if I was 20 or 40 years younger, I'd be tempted to go for a PhD here. But uh, sadly, my life is probably on a trajectory that's going to take me away from going into uh, research. But uh, nonetheless, I hope to share with you what I've learned over the last uh, decade and more in working in plastics, both at my former agency, the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, and founding the Pesticide Stewardship Alliance, which has a large plastics initiative within it, and also in working for Genesis Poly Recycling in Minnesota for, a, for about a year, or not quite a year, until they went out of business, not because of what I did do or didn't do, it was sadly other circumstances that got in the way of, of that company not doing what it could have done uh, to make this really work for all of North America. So anyway, let me get dive into the topic, and uh, I think we have until 1 o'clock or so, is that correct? And uh, I think what we'll do is this. Uh, if you have a pressing question that you really want to Pin me down on as it comes up and as I'm talking, raise your hand. Uh, I'm going to give you a very scattered uh, kind of 10,000-foot uh, view on what, I, what I've done and how I pulled together the topic of plastics and, and sustainability for today. And then towards the end, I hope this, to end soon enough so I can show a DVD that I think a lot of you might find pretty intriguing because it brings together the hidden side of plastics recycling, which is you can't do plastics recycling until you know plastics processing. If you don't know plastics processing, you should not be in plastics recycling. It's just that simple. So that DVD will bring it out as the key topic at the end. Okay, so uh, only to uh, the fact that you, you to short maybe re rethink what I have been doing for so long that I wanted to give it a twist for sustainability. So I created this kind of uh, ad hoc uh, definition, if you will. I guess I should stand back here so the, uh, can the camera see me here? I'm sorry, I guess I stepped out of it. No, okay, all right, okay. I guess there's an arc I've got to stay within here, so just go like this if you see me wander too far away. Uh, so I think plastic sustainability for me means taking full advantage of, of the technology benefits while not causing significant economic displacement. I should put harm there as well, and allowing for full life cycle stewardship. So it's a complex thing I'm going to do over the next uh, half hour or so, but this is kind of the core of how I'm going to bring all these things together for the purposes of the seminar today. So uh, plastic is all over agriculture. When I was driving down here today, I didn't see a lot, to be honest with you, in your state, but in my state, Wisconsin and Minnesota, Michigan, uh, there would be remnant uh, sheets of plastic flying all over off of egg bags or bunker covers or uh, past uses from last year. 
but in general, plastic is penetrating all of agriculture, uh, whether it be beekeeping, whether it be aquaculture, whether it be uh, grains, uh, grain bags in Canada. Uh, if you've never seen a grain bag, uh, I don't know if I have a picture one here in this program, not today, but it's a fascinating technology in the Great Plains of Canada in Western America, these large 400 foot, 300 foot grain bags that store grain until the farmer decides to take it to market or to uh, sell it off. But anyway, it's all over. It offers great uh, technology benefits for farmers, management benefits, and so we're going to see more and more of it in all kinds of sectors in agriculture. That's just the way it is. And uh, uses here, I mentioned a couple already. You can read along my back end, but uh, beehives, seedling trays, drip tape, on and on it goes. There's hardly a use in agriculture that you can hardly not think of something where you can substitute a current, uh, say, hard product, whether it be metal or something else, for the use of uh, uh, some, some sort of plastic. Mulches are big in Florida and some of our major horticultural states, vegetable and fruit states, strawberries. Strawberries use lots of, of, of plastic mulch, tomatoes, a lot of other ground crops. Florida, Arizona, California, lots and lots of mulch. And that's where there's a lot of interest in recycling and taking these products and getting a reuse out of them. So uh, here's what I want to do briefly is one of the problems with agricultural plastics is you can kind of guess at what's out there and what's used every year because of raw industry generation numbers of resins produced by type and by sector. However, what's really available is different. Availability is a function, in our case, of after you've used the material, you've got to do something with it if you're going to do full life cycle stewardship. So knowing what's available is different than knowing what's out there and what's used every year. So at the bottom, just to kind of give you a sense of what kind of numbers we're talking about, uh, I happened to do a little digging and saw that this is from a 1912 figure, or 2012 figure, 32 million tons of waste plastic are produced in America, it's just America, every year. And this is waste plastic. So it doesn't mean it's, uh, uh, I'm guessing by the source, it's all plastics. How much of that is ag plastic? Probably in the order of 3 to 5%. So when we look, when we track back to why is it so low, one of the reasons or a couple of the reasons relate to the fact that some farmers get multiple uses out of plastics. They can actually, in the case of bunker covers, if you've seen large dairy states, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan to some extent, uh, bunker covers can be used more than once. And so just because you, a farmer buys a sheet of it for a bunker, it doesn't mean he's going to get rid of it at the end of the dairy season. He's probably going to try to reuse it. If you can, for the next year, maybe get up to three years' use out of it. Uh, hoop houses, some of the high houses, some of those you can push a little bit and get another use out of if you've been careful. So it all depends on where you are and whether you're really using the plastic in a consumptive way to whether that really becomes available as a waste at the end of the crop season or production season. So anyway, all that accounts for the differences in plastic use versus availability for reuse, those are different numbers and they're very hard to uh, find in agriculture. So uh, to make sustainability work in agriculture for plastics, what do we have to do? These are the two key ingredients that you have to overcome to make it work in agriculture, that is the concept of sustainability of plastics. To facilitate the full life cycle stewardship, you, they must have characteristics and value that can be economically recaptured to allow for other uses by interested consumers. That is, the inherent end material that you generate somehow, some way, that has to have enough value or potential that somebody wants it to, to, to try to make it into something that somebody else may want to purchase or acquire. And then the, by, the byproduct of that first point is the second point, which is the fact that uh, in order for that company or that entity to remain in business, somebody has to want it, but beyond that point, before they venture into that deep world of uh, agricultural plastics recycling or beneficial reuse, in the case of plastics to oil, you've got to overcome some of the significant barriers that are, over, that, that are out there. If you're a company that wants to be profitable, you cannot just jump in You've got to do a lot of research, a lot of digging to make sure that you've got the right processing, 
you know the right resins, you've got the right concept of cleanliness in your plastics, and you have consumers who want your end product. And just to kind of give you a little hint at something I'll see in a few minutes, but we're talking about plastics to oil. One of the big problems with plastics to oil is what's called an off-take agreement. When you want to take, there's many companies that are, that are flirting with the topic of uh, pyrolysis and polymer dethermalization for many, many years. But the problem is that they cannot be successful unless somebody wants their end product. And it's a very delicate balance in now that's finding an entity that wants your end product before you go through the entire process of doing your bench testing, your demonstration plant, your pilot plant, and finally your commercial plant. You've got to know that there's an oil company, there's a distributor, there's somebody out there that wants that oil. If there isn't, you better not take that leap and go into the middle of plastics to oil because you might get burnt and plenty of companies have. So anyway, those are some broad concepts here for you to think about and play with as I start to get into the meat of my topic now. So, life cycle stewardship, what does it look like on a dairy farm in the case of dairy plastics? This is my good colleague, uh, <coughs> Lois Levitan from Cornell. I don't know if any of you followed her research out of Cornell. Uh, she's one of America's and the, one of the world's, uh, I guess world's in some ways, foremost researchers in agricultural plastics. Uh, she's been doing this for more than I have actually. We work together on our national programs uh, through the Stewardship Alliance. Lois has done a lot of work like this out of her institute in uh, Cornell. And this kind of gives you an idea of what a life cycle looks like in a dairy farm. A plastic film for uh, bunker covers, for egg bags, or silo wraps, etc. They come into the farm, they're used in some way. If the farmers don't have a way to recycle, or if nobody wants their plastic, what do they do? They either burn it or they bury it on farm. Uh, hopefully not that many do that, but the truth is there's a lot of glory fires in a lot of egg country in a lot of uh, dark evenings uh, in the middle of the night. So uh, it's sad to say, but it's true. Uh, farmers, but once they, they're labor strapped oftentimes, especially the dairy farmers, they got to take shortcuts, and the burning in Wisconsin is illegal, but it's kind of a wink and a nod thing. As long as you don't get caught, you kind of keep it going. Because even in our state, after all the years that I've been out there trying to help farmers recycle, there's still not that many companies that want that plastic yet. So dumping or burning is still kind of what they do. The good thing here is that there are landfills in the state, and uh, uh, public sites in particular that will take uh, waste plastic. So a lot of farmers have switched over to putting a roll-off box in their farms. If nobody is out there to recycle it or to take it for another use, you now do see roll-off boxes in farms in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and even Michigan, where all that waste material goes in. And then the waste hauler comes by every so often to grab the roll-off box, and it goes to the landfill where it's buried forever. Well, sort of forever, maybe. So I'll talk about that a little later. So otherwise, if you get lucky and have a recycling option that's in the middle there, it looks like that. So that's just kind of a kind of a full cycle look at what we want to try to avoid. We, we don't want to waste the energy. If we can get there, we can do that. Uh, but we definitely don't want the upper options, on-farm burning or on-farm dumping. We, if we have to go to that, let's at least look at a uh, certified or public site of some sort so that at least gets properly managed uh, for uh, keeping the contaminants out of the environment. So, uh, two core uses of plastics. I already hit it at one, or actually both of them, really. Uh, plastics to fuel, and what we have up here in the upper left would be the uh, Agilex uh, uh, cookers, as they call them, out of Brooks, Oregon, uh, and uh, that's out by Portland. And that's a sample in that bottle of the crude oil made from mixed plastics. Uh, and of course, at the bottom we have uh, pellets, these are traditional plastic pellets. And then in this case, they, uh, they're shown as being converted into what's called a terawatt, which is a uh, landscape block made in uh, Utah for a company in California. And on the table as you came in today, uh, there is a, some literature for the terawatt. So if you want to see a terawatt and its uh, specs and what it looks like, uh, I know 
the owner of the company. She does work the Midwest for plastic now, but not very consistently, to be honest. But she actually does make a terawatt from agricultural plastic. And so to her credit, she, she walks the walk and has done all the research to do the right thing. And so she's, she's out there trying to get a product that uh, people want to buy for their yards, uh, governments want to buy for their sidewalk replacements or for their tree throws. When roots pop up a sidewalk and you don't want to bust up the entire cement around the tree throw, you can drop in these terawalks to kind of arch over the uh, tree root. So it's a nice, handy solution, and there, there's literature on the table for that, for that uh, technology. So uh, let's talk about waste of, uh, of plastic to uh, fuel for a second. I saw in the uh, lobby of the library uh, that there's been a fair bit of research in that here. So this shows you why that could be a great, great solution. Uh, in, in agriculture, we have an awful lot of polyethylene plastic. And polyethylene would be LDPE and HDPE. And you can see it's just almost exactly the same as the BTU in fuel and gas and the so fuel oil. So you can see that, man, if there's some way we can make that into uh, uh, another fuel, wouldn't that be a great solution? Well, it would be, but it's not that easy. So then uh, coming on down, polypropylene is another very common uh, resin in agriculture. That's pretty high, too. I mean, it's just a little, just a tiny way away from polyethylene. So you have some resins there that are very, very close to the BTU value of oil. So you can see the, the, the concept here. Let's get that to oil if we possibly can through a pyrolytic process or style process. Then coming on down, you can see these other numbers probably in your other work here on the campus. But uh, you can see coal, as good as coal is, and coal is used all over for uh, our power plants, it doesn't match anywhere close to polyethylene potential. So what, years ago when I was pitching this in our state, Wisconsin, I would make the claim that you know, if we did this right, we could have kind of a uh, kind of like an oil field made out of plastics in our state. And so I make that pitch, and I get these people look at me like, "What are you talking about, Roger? That's crazy. Uh, you, you can't do that." Well, you can do that, but you've got to be patient, and you've got to follow the, the process and follow your experience. So uh, here's a, here's just a quick review of uh, common polymers that are used for the recycling code. And uh, the ones that are in agriculture, uh, number one is your PET bottles, PET, polyethylene uh, terpolate. Uh, that's not a, a valuable, useful resin for agriculture. Uh, number two is uh, HDPE. Three is not, even though it's used in agriculture for, uh, for plumbing and piping and certain uh, specialized uses. Four is very widely used in agriculture, LDPE, and linear low that's polyethylene, so LLDPE and LDPE. Five is used in agriculture a lot. And actually, it's also used a lot in horticulture. When we speak, when I speak of agriculture, by the way, I'm speaking of the totality of all of agriculture, including horticulture, uh, silviculture, and any other of the classic, more outdoor uh, entrees for plastic in our world, uh, marine environments, uh, aquaculture. I broadly, in my my include those in agriculture. So when I say that, I'm giving a per, pretty wide cast of the characters there. Uh, polystyrene, so five and six. Six is not used so much in, in normal uh, agriculture, but it is used uh, normal. It is used a lot in uh, horticulture for pots and trays, like when you go to a nursery. Finally, we can go to a nursery after a long, cold winter and buy some plants. i got to put in the ground myself so well, that crispy plastic that you buy when you get those trays, that's polystyrene. A lot, most of that's polystyrene material. That's also recyclable and also very common where nurseries and greenhouses, as is polypropylene number five. So again, four of these polymers, resins, are very common to agriculture. And that's going to play out very importantly in the next slide. I think it's, I think it's my next one. Oh, not quite coming up. So anyway. Uh, I'll come back to that momentarily. So there's two fundamental problems with agricultural plastics. First is contamination. Uh, again, I'm giving you kind of a broad 10,000 foot view of my years of experience here. So contamination is a huge problem for agricultural plastics. 
as soon as you get dirt levels or weight levels of non uh, resins above five to ten percent, you're usually in trouble. So, and guess what? Some of these plastics are very hard to keep below five percent coming off the farm, off the field, off the livestock operation, off the uh, uh, apiary, off the uh, maple syrup operation, maple tubing in Vermont. That's plastic tubing now, by the way. Uh, it's got syrup in it at the end of the season, but it's it's still very good uh, recyclable plastic. It's just got that sticky, or that kind of semi-sticky syrup inside it. Uh, mulch foam is here. That's, I think, in California. It's probably a strawberry field there. Uh, a lot of dirt on those things. Uh, this is something that uh, I'll talk about occasionally today, also containers. These are HDPE containers. HDPE is a very important uh, plastic resin, very, very desirable. Uh, used for plastic pesticide containers to many, uh, many bulks, widely used for lots of different things, but not so wise to burn it. <laughs> it's just hard to resolve the West Coast. Uh, so that, that's a uh, kind of a classic contamination scene. Uh, you know, probably the rinse states on the ground here, the farmers burning, uh, low burning temperatures, maybe producing some dioxins because there's some other organics in there. So that field's probably going to be dosed with some. Uh, pollutants of various kinds. This is inside a MRF uh, in just a five miles from my house in Wisconsin. If you don't have constant management, even inside a MRF, guess what? That plastic went to uh, Lindsay Smith from Terracon she, to her northern Indiana operation. And when they got it, they said, we don't want it. Why? Because Bill, my MRF manager down the street from me, the, he, he disappeared for a couple of days. This guy's bailed up plastic, but what do they do? They also have some other plastic to decide to bail up with the egg plastic. So there's three to four to five different kinds of plastic here, and that's already bad enough. And then, of course, each one has different levels of dirt on them, which is also worse. So in the end, and then, of course, because it's on the floor of a dirty facility, you have wood in there, other debris, and so what happened was she never accepted that load. She turned it down. So it's not because the plastic wasn't good enough or couldn't be used. It's on-site management. If you don't have farmers and a chain of quality control throughout the system, you get this, and the processor says, uh-uh, no way. If you're, I'm sending it back, or I'm, we're, getting, we're getting rid of it, and you're paying the bill. Or they used to go to China, quite honestly, some of it, but even China saying we don't want that either now. So anyway, contamination is a big problem. So this is my friend Lois Levitan in Cornell. This is a, I just love this slide that she did a couple of years ago. She's pitting resins in agriculture versus dirt by type. So what you want to do then, the highest and best types of plastic are near the top up here. So we'll just look at the top ones for you for just a quick second. Uh, triple rinse pesticide containers, bale wrap, greenhouse covers. Uh, I don't think in this one she put rain, uh, rain bags on there, but if, uh, I think she updated this with rain bags up there. So rain bags are very clean, by the way. Feed bags, super sacks, so all those upper ones are high demand, very clean materials. Come down, lower here, you got, you got some serious problems. Mulch film is some of the worst film to work with, but just a lot of it. So there you go. It's volume versus contamination, and it's just not a good relationship. So anyway, you kind of see what she's doing here, what she did, and I think it's a great slide to kind of demonstrate the dynamics of uh, resin use and contamination, because that's a big, big problem in agriculture. So, next one is collecting economically sustainable volumes. Great, there's plastic all over Wisconsin, it's great, there's plastic all over Illinois. So what? Can you make it work? Can you get enough of it in an economically viable quantity to help a processor or end market be successful? Because if you can't, it's a no-go. And too often, companies that have jumped into this world didn't have things figured out and they got in trouble because of this right here. Uh, they don't want to pay for the plastic. They want it free because they call it low-hanging fruit. They think it's free. All we got to do is take it. The farmers 
uh, you know, kind of like the old, uh, uh, what you know, the uh, baseball movie, uh, do it and they will come, or build it and they will come kind of thing. Um, not true in this case. Um, you have to have a place to take the plastic, somebody that wants it before you collect it. So all these things circle back. It's kind of like its own mini ecosystem, this, thing, this, this topic right here. If someone doesn't want it to pull the plastic in, it doesn't happen, and it doesn't go anywhere. Or if it, it gets collected, it gets collected in a big pile, uh, stored in a MRF or stored at somebody's business, stored at a co-op. Finally, nobody comes to take it. The co-op gets pissed off. I'm never going to do that again. Don't bother me with another recycling solution. I did it once, and we couldn't get rid of it. I had to take it to the landfill. And you cannot talk that person back into doing recycling. So sometimes if you can't do it right, you're better off not to do it at all in this case. Uh, these are nursery pots from Wisconsin. That was a collection I was at. Uh, so that, that's uh, probably uh, polypropylene and maybe some, uh, oh, they also make uh, HDPE containers. So polypropylene and HDP, HDPE containers are common also at nursery, nurseries and nursery locations. Um, this, uh, by the way, here, uh, off to the lower left, uh, that's a baler in New Zealand called the Pioneer Baler. Uh, and I know the person that developed that baler. We had him at our conference in San Diego. I consider that the world's best baler for agricultural films. It's a horizontal baler, and most horizontal balers that are used inside MRFs or recycling facilities are hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they have automatic ties. I mean, they handle lots of plastic because they have to. This one is designed for farm plastics and uh, outdoor applications in New Zealand. And I consider that one of the world's best bailers for agricultural plastics recycling. That, that farmer there, oops, hold on, just the upper left, I'll go back as quickly. Okay, this one up here, that's a Minnesota farmer that took an old cardboard baler and said, I can do this, I can bail. And so he uh, just he put a, he bought a, uh, his, uh, bought a, probably that baler cost him a couple thousand dollars at most. And this gentleman, uh, I, I went once knew his name, I could probably search it out if I had to, uh, set about to, to, on his own, that's how dedicated, he, he cleaned all that plastic, bailed it nicely, and he ended up with a, a truckload or more of plastic just by himself. But it took him a couple years to do that. And once people knew that he had it, he, he got rid of it overnight. Why? Because it's clean. They trusted the guy. He bailed it well. And it was great confidence between him, the producer, and the processor in the Twin Cities area. So that shows you what can be done with a great manager who wants to do it right and bring the plastics to a reuse potential. But that isn't all that common, but honestly. Okay. So uh, here's the real problem. This is my state. So how do you how do you pick how do you design a collection system for that? I mean, there's farms everywhere. Those are dairy farms, and so what you have then is like, what do you do? I mean, how do you go? From, do you go from farm to farm to farm? Do you create a central lo collection location and have farmers bring it from all the way up to like Kewanee County up here, down to let's say Oshkosh over here? Oshkosh is there. Uh, I mean, how do you make this work? So the whole idea of logistics and infrastructure, that's what I did for my old Genesis company in Minnesota before they went out of business. And uh, it's a struggle because there aren't that many bailers out there and no company wants to take loose plastic. You could not afford to put uh, trucks, typically, you know, the semis, the 53 footers, if you, if you pack it right, you get 40 to 40,000 pounds plus onto a truck. If you did a loose, you can, you can maybe get 10,000 pounds in there. Even with just, you know, kind of some light packing. You cannot make money. It's three bucks a mile though for a truck. At least three bucks a mile. You cannot make money and you cannot expect a, a recycling company to collect plastic loose. It's got to be bailed. Once it's got to be bailed, well, who, who's, who's got the bailers? Who's, what, is a recycling company going to buy a bailer for a farmer over here? Probably not. So you got a huge infrastructure problem now. What do you, how do you solve it? I mean, how do you make this work now? If you have to have a baler to get 40, 
about 40,000 pounds plus in a truck. How do you get this to work? So it gets complicated. Well, pretty quickly too, by the way. So anyway, moving along here. So I'm going to talk about the fuel operation in brief. Um, can somebody give a map? Oh, here's it. Let's watch it. Let's look at the clock here just to kind of keep a little track, close track of time. So uh, let me spin to these kind of quickly now. Uh, fuel option. Looks like a lot of your work here, or some of your work has, has been involved in plastics to fuel. This is the Agilex uh, schematic out of uh, Brooks Oregon. Ag uh, Agroplast was a company that was mentioned over here with this gentleman. This is the technology they used that was upscale to, to go to this level of uh, sophistication. Uh, sadly, to bring that to your story current in this company, they were America's only company to take pure, well, only agricultural plastics to make tanker loads of oil just from agricultural plastic. Then what happened, guess what? Uh, waste management got involved in their uh, capital decision making. Waste management gave them a bunch of money. Uh, they took down their facility in, in uh, Brooks, Oregon, where the initial, initial plant, test plant was located, built another plant near Portland, Oregon, and they could not duplicate the uh, process that they used to make the agricultural plastics, and now they're kind of going backwards. They actually, and not out of business, but they're stalled out because the technology got ahead of their ability to keep the resins equal or of the, of the competent quality to make the process work the way it worked at their test plant at Brooks, Oregon. So this is a classic case of kind of the, uh, of the technology not keeping up with investors and who's making decisions because in the end, this technology could have worked just for egg plastics and the people I know, that I knew with agroplast, who I still know, didn't want them to do what they did. They wouldn't listen to them. They tried to make it more general, for more, more wider ranges of plastic, and the system collapsed. So now they're back in another research mode, and they're going lateral. Uh, they're not going backwards, but they're not going forwards either. So delicate stuff, and this is what it looks like in brief. So uh, there's their plan up there. This is, I guess, as I understood it, uh, the blessed technology has been purchased by the Institute, is that correct, for sure? So this is, I believe, that I took these out of uh, some of the, some of the uh, work I have back in my house. I think that's a blessed unit there. You say, I'm not sure which model it is. That's a blessed one there. This is a Chinese one. Uh, I forget which one that is. I have to look at my uh, kind of uh, cheat sheet to remind me, but it comes from Anson China, I believe. So anyway, I've been following these technologies for a lot of years, and for my national conferences every year, I do an update of technologies that are making a move uh, in North America in particular. So these are technologies that I track. In fact, that, what, that one I mentioned whoops, earlier is right at the top there. Uh, Green Mantra is a very interesting technology out of Canada, Brantford. Uh, they make waxes, industrial waxes. And of all the companies that I've seen, they really have something going for them. Green Mantra out of Brantford, Ontario. I would recommend if you want to see something that's kind of cutting edge, making money, and well thought out, I would recommend that company to look at and chase down. Uh, the Blessed Company also, I believe, um, let's see, there's one of these, if I'm not mistaken, I'll find out afterwards, but oh, right here. Uh, Bless is up there, third one down from the top. And there was another company out of Vancouver, uh, H2 here, which I can find it. Uh, Clean it. Oh, then there it is, okay. Um, that's what it is. There, um, it's third line down where I have less to mention. The company in Vancouver, Washington, has a licensing technology for West in North America. So it's E N E R G Y in Vancouver. And I talked to the owner there this past uh, uh, winter, and uh, they are actually trying to modularize and improve their technology. So if you haven't kept up with them, if you haven't called that company, uh, I re recommend that you visit with them. I don't know if I brought this up with me. I don't think that I did this time. But another one that uh, I have potential for is John out of Florida. Uh, Lois is going to visit them in uh, July, and I may be able to try to get there myself, but uh, JUM. Uh, actually has some interest in uh, working on agricultural plastics as well, so 
I'm hoping they could also make a dent in that world as well. So uh, coming back to uh, kind of the footprint on uh, what, what are these companies doing? This is Rational Energies out of Minnesota. And you'll see here, these are the plastics they like to work with for uh, plastics to fuel. Uh, look at the materials, uh, HDPE, LDPE, polypropylene, polystyrene. So in theory, Rational Energies should want agricultural plastics. Vedex out of Ohio, same thing here. Plastics they like, two, five, uh, four, six, you know, all the ones that we just talked about in agriculture. So these companies do like agricultural plastics, except for the contamination and except for the fact they can't get enough on a sustained basis. So uh, here's a few challenges for, for fuel and grief. Uh, they need predictive, they want to run these plants 24-7. They don't want any downtime with the fuel plant. So it's getting volumes is a big thing to them to make it work. Uh, and of course, as we all know, ag plastic volumes are typically scattered. Uh, and they're hard to collect into a load. Uh, they can be dirty, so we've gone over that stuff. So here's some basics on fuel programming I put together just for kind of today's purposes in part. Uh, so I, my vision would be that regional and local collection programs in close proximity to fuel facilities are best positioned to take advantage of this. So if there was a fuel company in the greater Illinois area within 200 miles of a Chicago or Peoria or here, uh, then you would have something that you could really anchor and build around if they want to take agricultural plastics. And if you can get them the volume that they need, then you've got something you can work with. Uh, because shipping this stuff across country is not going to be profitable. The company will not want to pay for that long distance shipping. So you got the shipping thing, bailing thing, so more localized production apparatus and business models are the best ways to perceive a sustainable approach with fuel options. Um, working with uh, farm organizations would be a good idea. If there's Illinois farmer groups, dairy groups, whatever, they could be a great partner for getting all their farmers to buy into the idea of shipping their plastics to a common collection point so someone can make this work. So I would ask you to think about working with your Illinois commodity groups, farm associations, make them a partner Give them, put some skin in the game for them, and they will likely be interested in helping their members uh, get rid of their plastics and helping the technology do what it can do. Okay, and then the last one in this is uh, uh, keep, always keep plastics as clean as possible and segregated by resin type. Uh, even though the great cell for plastics to fuel is that we can put all kinds of plastics in, in your cooker, don't believe it. Uh, don't believe it until you see it. <laughs> because that's what happened to uh, uh, Agilix. Uh, they got too greedy. Uh, they thought they could do everything with their system, and they couldn't, and they basically gone horizontal now. So knowing your resins, knowing your processing, keeping things clean is all essential to make <coughs> And here's some other, uh, some more information I threw in there for you for today's uh, program, and it'll be, I guess, available uh, on campus then, so. Yeah. So that you can do that research or look up afterwards. Okay, I'm going to talk about recycling in brief. Okay, I've, I've probably painted kind of a dismal picture about recycling so far. So recycling can work because there are some companies that are doing it. Uh, Brian and Cordage upper left, right up here, uh, they recycle polypropylene twine and they make a recycled twine called Revolver right there. But the problem they're having, because we had them at our San Diego conference, not enough farmers are buying their recycled twine. So even though it's their twine, they bought it, they were sent back to the factory, they made more twine out of it, it's just as good as the old twine, they're not selling enough of it. And so they may, they're worried about the drop, the drop in the society set. Years to develop recycled polypropylene twine, and they may have to walk away from it because they can't get people to buy it. Farmers are not buying enough of it. Uh, here's terawatts, the one that I've already talked about. Think plastics are right up here at the top. Uh, they use crumb plastic, and I hope to run a video here in a few minutes to show you what crumb plastic is. And they make baleboard and new sheet, uh, which are some pure polyethylene materials out of uh, agricultural films from southern Ontario. And this is a company, I think it's, this is the Antec one, that recycles nursery pots out of the landscape sector and nursery sector. 
Uh, nurseries, by the way, are, have been very good, and their uh, plastic processors who provide their pots and trays, they're taking the pots and trays back from that company on kind of a, a whole life cycle basis on a take back scheme, and then recycling them uh, with that same company. So, so the landscape sector is a little ahead of the dairy and film sector in offering take back potentials for recycling. So here's a processing facility in Kansas City. Here's what it looks like. Uh, that's, as you can see, veiled ag film there, black and white from ag bags and bunker bags. And then this is the shredded and clean plastic here, headed out for compounding and extrusion into a resin that will be then made into something else somewhere down the line. So that's what inside of a recycling, or I should say, a processing facility looks like for plastics. OK, so. and. Just to repeat myself, this is not for the timid recycling of ag plastics. Uh, it's not a mature industry. There's been as many figures as successes. Uh, and depending solely on ag plastics, it's a very risky business proposition. Uh, for the reasons I've already cited, I won't repeat all those. I've talked about take back. Uh, take back uh, is wise, but only a few markets do it. Twine, nursery pots, pesticide containers to the ACRC do it. But mostly, it's, it's kind of uh, case of ras or rock or most of the plastic. Um, and something else to not uh, forget is that ag plastic competes with virgin plastics in the pellet market. So the company is used to using pellets as a raw material to make an end product. And if you happen to be making recycled pellets for recycled plastic, your recycled pellet is competing with a virgin pellet. So it doesn't sound like a big deal, but it is, because if you cannot meet the same quality standards with that recycled pellet as the virgin pellet, you're going to have trouble. You're not going to sell as much resin or pellet. And in fact, if that company then has quality control problems with their end product, they're never going to buy your pellets again from a recycled material. So recycled pellets compete with virgin. Virgin is safer. Uh, it's a bit, uh, uh, depends on markets, markets uh, flex a bit, may cost a little bit more, but companies like the fact that they can be quality assured, they know what they're getting every time with the virgin pellet. So I'm going to skip along here. So uh, this is a company in California that went out of business. This was going to be like Genesis, the company I worked for for part not quite a year. Uh, they went out of business. They were going to be the West Coast answer to recycling the bank plastics. Well, uh, look when they came in. Sometimes life is a matter of timing. Um, they came in just as the markets crashed and as there's huge fluctuations in uh, oil prices. So they, they had to bear that out. The prices dropped. And once that dropped, uh, they lost their marketing edge for their end materials because once you have to, once you invest in a system to remanufacture recycled films into a pellet or a product, you've got the cost of collecting all that plastic from all over by trucks. You've got to bring it to a central site for shredding. Then you've got to clean it. A cleaning system for uh, dirty plastic can be anywhere from $200,000 to a million dollars, depending on what, your, what level of quality control you need. So if you have to clean plastic to get it into a pellet, or an end product, your, the cost of your raw material goes up proportionate to the, to the uh, cost of that machinery, maintenance, etc., and is competing then against virgin plastics, which may be stable and may be a lot more predictable. So that's what we have to deal with here in the case of companies that work and companies that don't work, costs, and even here you can see that mistakes are made where equipment and grips. So here's Eno Plastics. That they were given a lot of grants by a county in Ventura County. Uh, they ended up with equipment problems. Why? Because of grit. When you've got to chop up and shred dirty plastic with uh, uh, either sand and clay and other materials on it, it wears the blades faster, higher maintenance, and it just is a drag, and you didn't anticipate it. And so there's a lot of things that happen then when you don't really think through what you're doing and you don't have the experience to make it work for you. 
So this is a survey of markets that you, these are the kind of things that you have to do to really make sure that a company who wants the plastic is getting what they want. These are the kind of questions that you better ask. So I'm not, I'm not going to spend any time on that in the interest of time today. So uh, here's just some final end pictures of uh, plastic recycling in action. Uh, these are mini bolts. This is a Wisconsin collection. This is from Canada. Uh, grain bags and twine. We've already talked about those two uh, commodities. Uh, this is uh, pesticide containers. This is America's only full cycle stewardship, industry supported recycling program for plastics that really has proven the test of time. It's the ACRC, and they take and they set back empty pesticide containers. They trip, make all their farmers got to triple rinse them. Once they're triple rinsed, they go through a quality control system. Uh, they, they quality control the vendors who get, the, get these containers, and everything is quality controlled from the top on down. And, these, and this plastic is turned into drain tile, curb bumpers, uh, plastic lumber, anything that, that does not come into contact with people, that, those are all allowed uses to the ACRC. So it's a very successful program. If you want a model to follow, this would be a good one to look at. And this is another, this is a Wisconsin collection right here. Um, there were three types of uh, plastic collected in Wisconsin last year by this by Terawatts, this company from California. Black and white materials. Other materials, either clear, green, or brown. And then all other materials, twines, uh, netting, and other bags. So uh, they have three different sorts at this one collection to keep things segregated properly by resin and by material. So uh, where are we headed? Uh, I think the best answer for recycling would be more regional and sub-regional business models. Smaller plants, less capital, responsive to local sourcing. It's the same phenomenon I kind of see with uh, plastics to oil. If you can get a smaller modular plant that doesn't have to drive lots and lots of plastic from all over uh, the upper Midwest, but can kind of survive the plastic in a smaller region, it's a better, safer, quality control system, less capital, more investors, uh, better throughput, and things can turn around faster. So I'm going to skip this right here. You can just kind of read along. It'll be on the uh, website here. But uh, other thing is that uh, this is one thing I've noticed in my state and maybe other states. Minimal, minimal interest by most public agencies in direct collecting assistance. It is, they don't mind advertising for somebody. Uh, if uh, the companies I talked about today want to collect plastic, they'll be happy to advertise. Do they want to send their field staff out to help a collection? Maybe once or twice. After that, they kind of expect it to run on its own. So that's one of the dynamics here of plastics recycling in government. It's okay for a start. It's good advertisement, but there's not a lot of great follow-through, but honestly, that's something I see quite a bit kind of all over. So uh, I'm going to talk about a final kind of interesting opportunity, uh, plastic-infused biomass. How many of you know what I'm even talking about here? It sounds goofy, doesn't it? Okay, it turns out that you can actually take biomass materials, wood shavings, uh, wood fines, and other materials, and you can, of course, make a pellet out of it. But what if you add plastic to it? What would that do? Well, it adds BTU value. And of course, the plastic serves as a binder to keep the pellet together. So to make a long story short, a Wisconsin company that I worked with for years, for several years, actually has done this. And I've got some samples here of gas one right now. And it looks like this. So there's their shredder. That's egg film. to shred it up. Uh, this is their process here. You didn't want me to take, take a picture of units like that. Take the backside of it. But it looks like that, and then they uh, produce these pellets. But guess what happened? Let's get one here. Um, what happened was, in this case, because this, this pellet was competing with coal in our state, because the idea of this company was to make enough of these pellets to actually sell to a power plant. Well, once our, new, once our governor switched over a couple years ago and came into office, he didn't want dirty oil, dirty energy to compete, to have extra competition sponsored by the state. The, the UW-Madison had a has a Charter Street power plant 
it was going to be converted into a biomass testing facility. And as soon as he came into office, he scrapped and said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to keep it coal. Thank you. So this company uh, uh, that I was referred to a moment ago, Wood Residual Solutions, they were going to send a test load, several test loads of their pellets to that eventual plant, the biomass uh, plant in Madison, the new uh, generator and, uh, and burner for testing. Well, once the governor came on board and said, I don't want competition for dirty coal, dirty energy, that idea went under. And now they're out of business. So this is a case where government got in its own way, tripped on itself, and a great idea was never foreseen and never happened because of government policy shifting and changes. But anyway, uh, getting back to this, so here's the ultimate idea here that this company had. They actually, in our state, we have emerald ash borer. We have it in your state. They actually had emerald ash borer lots because I was inside the factory. They were shredding them up. They were going to actually help let these emerald ash borer tree, uh, ash borer trees, come into this plant, shred them. That was going to be the base material to feed through their feedstock and to add plastic to for local farmers to make these pellets that allow for for better forestry management and also for better farm sustainability by allowing farmers to get rid of their plastics, which would be used then in forestry to help forestry manage their forest better, to produce an energy product that could be used by all of us to have cheaper and cleaner fuel. Well, they went out of business. <laughs> so I don't know what they did the logs. I saw them shred it up. But, not, but anyway, that would have been a great sustainable solution. I don't know if you've played with that here at your institute or not, but I think this is a fantastic idea, and I just encourage you to maybe think about it. And if you do want to think about it, I could probably get you to some sources in Wisconsin. So the end would be thank you. I took a little longer than I thought, but I guess I always do, it seems. Um, so the bottom line is that with, with whether it be plastics to fuel, plastics uh, for recycling or whatever, you've got to do your homework before your field work. You cannot afford to go fast with this stuff. Don't rush. Do your research, do your homework, and that's the only way you're going to come out ahead because otherwise the this area is just replete with uh, failures and uh, partial successes that could have gone different ways, but it didn't because of improper thinking, improper capitalization, uh, not understanding the technology well enough, not understanding plastic processing technology well enough. So there's a lot of things that could get in your way. So I'm going to play the uh, DVD now. What the DVD is uh, in Canada, that uh, same company I mentioned before, Think Plastics, they use this crumb plastic to make high quality materials. I happen to have a couple with me here. So I'm going to send around a couple items here to look at. Oh, it's getting that queued up. Do you want me to start it or yeah, just okay. let me know? Okay. Um, so those are some well, well, DVD from uh, Left Plastic, uh, Pestle Injection Molding Company in uh, Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. We have 12 uh, injection molding tons of water, uh, 39 grams to 720 tons. We've been working with Chuck Sparks now for about two years on a project with um, some bale wrappers, really. And uh, Chuck has figured out a process, to obviously, to uh, put this into a pellet form, that, like a crumb form that we can injection mold here. And started off just doing some small trials and eventually worked in the production part for Chuck. Uh, which are these closed pins here. And this is in, in full production now. Although they were dealt by many people who said in Jackson, this because the material is a fairly low melt. We still made it happen, as a matter of fact, it cools really well. Uh, it just has to be cooling has to be designed to accommodate the material. So whether it be the gating, uh, you know, better venting, et cetera, et cetera. These are a couple of the uh, key factors in molding this product. And in its natural form, just looks like a crumb, basically. And the only we have no complaints. The only obstacle that would uh, that there is to overcome is a little bit of dust. And other than that, um, you know, there's there's equipment that can that can handle that. So there's no issue here. Currently, we've been running some other trials on some other products, and uh, basically just existing products in house here, just to get an idea on how the flow, um, you know, how the material will flow, et cetera, et cetera. We ran some decks here. These are credit card machine decks, and we did some coloring as well, just to get an idea on colorability of the product. And it seems to work extremely well. The color concentrate was also made with the crumb. So uh, 
again, that's a local company that needs a manufacturer and they've done a great job on processing that. So it, it aided in this way there's really compatibilities with the resins. It's all the same stuff other than the fact that you know, two to four percent of it had been covered. And uh, what we did find is that edge gating is personal in a lot of these parts, although with the fact of the post pin, it is tunnel gated. Uh, it, it, uh, it will work. It's not the end of the world if you get tunnel gated if you want the tunnel gates are big enough and the parts thick enough to allow me you know, an easier entry of material into the cavity itself. But in this case here, these are, are these are two cavity molds that are edge gated and definitely creates just ease of mobility. It's, it's, it's a lot easier with the edge gates. Um, I mean, basically, other than that, in a nutshell, that's that's where we've come along with this material so far. I see good things in the future for it. I see, as a matter of fact, I'm working on some other products for our customers now, uh, especially with the huge demand of recycled products in the industry. So. On that note, I'd uh, just like to say it's been a pleasure, you know, working with this truck, and uh, hopefully we can keep moving forward. And that it's 100 percent. And it is 100 percent. This is correct. I forgot to mention that it is 100 percent refined. We're not putting any other versions of materials in this whatsoever. Although we have experimented with that, everything you see here that I showed you in this scope is 100 percent recycled and 100 percent refined. So it's fantastic. It's, it's definitely a great start and the environment. So. Okay, thanks, Dean. Thanks, Chuck. So, my point in showing that is, and I should have made this before, I had my complete slide up. One of the ways that agricultural plastics recycling can change the curve on being more successful is by getting rid of steps that cause processing problems. Cleaning is one of them. If you, if you can find a way to not need to clean as much, reduce your cost, you're ahead of the game. Also, if you have a technology like plumb plastic here that can take plastic and not need, doesn't need as much pre-shredding or pre-tuning up of it, if you will, the more you can shrink your capital needs to produce a, uh, a cheaper footprint plant that can produce a high quality output like this is, like what you saw in front of you, the better chance you have at creating an end product that you control more closely with good source, local sourcing economics, and by your knowledge of your technology. So the three technologies, uh, the three technologies that I think you have to be alerted to would be compounding, PIMS, powder injection molding systems, and this one, crumb plastic. Those are the, because conventionally what happens is recycling is done through pellets. Once you're going to do a pellet before you get to an end product, you dramatically increase your cost of production. Because you're making a pellet, just a little tiny pellet. Do you remember that can that you saw earlier in the program? When you've got to make a pellet before you can make an end product, you've got a lot of pre-steps to get to that point. But you can skip making the pellet, which is what all these three things, those three technologies do. You can save yourself a lot of extra capital investment, get to your end product faster, and save yourself cleaning as well, as long as you can quality control your input plastics. So a truck, for example, I know personally, who's going to get a conference support in Hawaii, but I'll mention briefly this will be in uh, Southern Florida, it's the Agricultural Plastics Recycling Conference. A uh, truck will be there with this technology. Um, if you can avoid all those steps and get to the end product faster, you have a better chance of creating a smaller regional plant that can survive just on local plastics and not depend so much on the mega stuff that can get these larger plants to from a business model standpoint. So I hope that makes sense. Does that make sense? Because that, that is an important point I want you to come away with today, is that getting rid of the steps that cause you difficulty and cost is what those three technologies can do. And that's why knowing about them and understanding them is a great idea. So with that, I'll stop. Yes, ma'am. Earlier in your presentation, you mentioned the need to buy or you talked about uh, plastics. Yes. You mentioned the need to find a buyer for the oil. Correct. Off-take agreement, it's called. My question is, why would someone not be interested in buying? Well, the, uh, for one thing, uh, quality assurance. 
because uh, it's one thing to say you, you produced it, to have that sample jar like I had there in that one photo. There's a jar of that uh, sweet crude, they called it, out of the Agilex style technology. And it's another to, number one, know that that uh, material is going to work well with your current cracking systems because if, if you're not making a final end product out of oil, that is to say a final dis distillate, whether it be for gasoline or you're making an end product diesel fuel, or whether you're going to be adding, let's say, some additives so it can be used in winter, every time you take a material and add something to it to make it more market compatible with your current line of products, you've got another concern that you're throwing at a company who wants to make it. It's not that they don't want to take your product. They just have to know what they're getting, and you have to guarantee that you can produce that material over and over and over again in some quantity that they have interest in because it's, it's one thing to do it and to say I can only produce a tanker load a week. They're going to laugh at you. you. Get to a tanker load a day and then we'll talk. Well, to get to a tanker load a day, if you're a, a plastics oil company, you've got to be cranking up your capital investment to put out that kind of oil per day. So, you, you, And then if the company's not sure they can do that, to make that commitment, to send out a tanker load a day or every other day to meet this company's off-take agreement demand, then you've got a system that starts to like, uh, I don't know if I can trust that, you know, that relationship with that product. So there's a lot of reasons why the more an oil company can, this is why the wax company in Ontario, uh, Green Mantra, is in such good uh, shape because they, uh, they have actually mastered the end product. And they have something that people want and will pay top dollar for, and they actually have enough cash on the table that they can go back in the marketplace and buy the plastic they want. So that was the idea with oils, with oil end products. Well, gosh, look at the value added of oil or, or diesel fuel. You can take you know low hanging fruit agricultural films, make this high value end product, and gee, there'll be money on the table. We can go back out and buy this plastic we need to. Well, the fact of the matter is, when you push companies on, when can you go out and buy your plastic from a farmer? They're never going to give you an answer to that. They're going to say, well, not for a while, <laughs> because they have other things that they get to resolve or concern themselves with before they would ever offer anything more than picking up your plastic for the cost of transportation. All these companies will be glad to come on and get it if you've got a load ready to go, or even a half load. What? Once you say, well, you know, I'd like to give it to you because I've got a, a truckload full of my house, but you're going to have to buy it from me. They're going to say, oh, unless you quality control it and I, we know you, and it's as clean as the one farmer from Minnesota's plastic, they're going to walk away and say, we're not paying you anything for that plastic. We're only taking free plastic. So it's a very tricky world, even for oil, to make oil revenue help put money on the table to buy farm plastic. It, it's, it's still far off maybe with the exception of the company uh, Green Mantra in Canada. They could probably do that if they wanted to. So does that help you with that? Any other? Yes. So um, it's, it's about the last few slides. So when, when you these pellets that you have, yes. they are mixed with plastics, are they already in you the know, market for, you know, for like conversion, conversions or any other processes? I mean, you say it's coming in the cold, right? So I'm assuming it's more used for a conversion type of reactions, right? So if that's the case, how many of the pollution, the emissions out of this because plastics, they cause a lot of dioxide emissions? Uh, well, in theory, that's true. In practice, at the temperatures that these industrial boilers burn at, and in fact, it's, as you saw the samples coming out, it's 12% plastic, or up to 20%. Most of their pellets they're running out of the plant just aren't going to be where to live was around 10 to 15 percent most plastic. And, and, you, and the difference you can see if you look at those pellets, it's kind of tell set it back, but uh, the more plastic, the shinier the pellet was, you can probably see a little bit. But the fact of the matter is that the, the, the bench test that I saw from this company was they, they got to answer that question that you raised. Can we show someone that that plastic, that pellet burns high enough not to produce significant emissions? The answer is that it's actually cleaner than coal, you know, except for the cleanest of like a percent coals. It, it actually, because it's not a lot of plastic, it's going to be wood, and because of the temperature of the incineration inside the boiler, it burns very, very clean, but not much ash at all. And so it was a, it was a very sought-after product, and still is, 
because that one slide I didn't spend time on, there's a lot of companies that make wood pellets for, for uh, kind of industrial boilers, but they get to the level to make them for a, a power plant, that's a huge operation because they want tanker loads and tanker loads of pellets, you know, to because they can't just run one tanker load of you know of pellets and that be done with they have to run many, many tanker loads of pellets. So this gets to the capitalization issue. In order to, to be a big player, you have to have big capital to produce the kind it's like playing with Walmart. It's kind of like a Walmart problem. If you want to play with Walmart, you better be able to crank out and meet their contract demands so if you don't, they're going to come after you or they're going to crop you. The same thing is true with the wood pellet industry. It's one thing to make industrial pellets that are inch and a half or so by uh, for uh, small scale industrial boilers for people that want to control their energy costs. It's way another to produce them for a uh, generation facility that really wants tons and tons and tons of those things. So that, that would be some of the differences there. That makes sense. So I understand that agricultural pest is going to be an issue with cleaning up, right? Uh, but it seemed like there was a lot of overlap between the types of plastics that were used in agricultural application, other uses of residential, commercial, you know, generation for urban, right? Uh, it, are there companies that are putting together the two streams of plastics? You know, so I, you know, it, you know, there's fine. There's some farms that are 50 miles away from the major town, but uh, you know, I, you know, think about the places that are coming off this campus or Madison uh, farms. Right? Can't they be combined with that? What are those things? Sure. For the municipal plastics. So what happens in, in practice is that I, I did mention this because I was kind of trying to get through the program before they already ended. Is that all these uh, plastics to uh, oil companies? Uh, to the extent you can pin them down at all, it's not that they wouldn't like taking agricultural plastics, the, the better ones, it's the fact that they cannot live on agricultural plastics alone because of the seasonality of farming in the northern hemisphere. Because, you know, like in my, our, our states, or my state in particular, Minnesota, Michigan, you've got the seasonality issue. Once winter hits, the farmers meet out of their bag, their, let's say the silo bag that the bumper covers for the bumpers. And, and, and farmers don't want to move plastic in winter. It's just a, it's already a difficult enough job. And so there's a seasonality to, to uh, plastics generation on farms. And so for that reason alone, it's difficult for any significant uh, venture into the world of fuel, fuel to oil and plastics to depend solely on egg plastics. But what happens is they kind of reverse it and say, if we find good loads, Good clean loads of stuff we like, we'll take them and we'll and let them accumulate maybe at their storage site or at their warehouse. But we depend on long term contracts from industries. So if you went to outside Chicago or maybe even here in Champaign, there's companies here that generate uh, plastic scrap. There's companies here that uh, probably uh, are produce uh, uh, packaging films because they're regional warehouses. Maybe trucks come in from all over America. They bring the pallets down, they take all that wrap off of pallet packaging uh, film, and they get these big wads of this, uh, of this either PVC style film or LPE film, and they don't mind getting rid of it. And maybe if you, if you had a, a micro processing recycling company here, they, they'd be delighted to take it. That's what we did in Minnesota with uh, my Genesis Power Company. Uh, we took, we went up to, to the Twin Cities and took plastic scrap and purgings. You know, when, they, when you set up an extrusion run or whatever, you usually run many runs through, and those are all wasted materials, and so that's scrap, basically. And so we would take the purgings, we take the floor scrap, all, and, we, and you can set up a long-term contract with a company like that. Uh, another thing I was doing before we went out of business, I was working with Cargill. Cargill was actually uh, using uh, for their horse feeds, I think it was horse feeds, I could be wrong. They put a lot, they made a special bucket, an HDPD bucket, and they go out every day to do their delivery lines to their, to their distribution routes, and they would be, and I was working to set up a cardinal take back scene as we went out of business uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, they also were using feed bags, but here's the problem with feed bags. If there's too much ink on a feedback or an ink 
weekend of uh, film material, uh, it causes huge problems for some kinds of recycling. Because number one, it's going to darken the end, the end plastic and only let it be used for, some, for certain kinds of uh, resins, certain kinds of end uses. So ink on the bags is bad news. So this gets back to a design, a consumer design or customer design recycling. So one of the things that I'll point out is a, another area of interesting exploration is working with packaging designers who are recycling that works right from the word go because if the package that someone is using to sell an end product isn't suitable for recycling because there's too many expressions in it, there's too much color in it, or there's some other faulty, or I'll say faulty, but there's some UV stabilizers in it, or some other materials in it that actually detract from its end use potential, then very few recyclers want it. That's why egg plastics are kind of nice because aside from UV stabilizers and, and some other, not even colors so much, I mean, there are some colors used in agricultural films. There's black, black and white, of course, the egg heads for, for making silage. But that's one of the nicer things about uh, uh, egg plastics is that they don't have all that mixed stuff that some of the other consumer plastics have in electric toy plastic and specialized plastic like tires and things. Uh, those are very complex plastics and they're cross, they're cross blended uh, and, and it's just a mess from a recycling standpoint unless the company that made that plastic wants all that stuff back and they can be used again. So that's where take back becomes interesting is when you have a complex plastic and the manufacturer of, of that part says, well, I'll take back all the old stuff that you get at your factory or at your breakdown facility because I can use it to make more of that stuff because it's already a complex plastic and already used, already made a complex plastic, so I'm already there. So does that help with that? Yeah, okay. Any other questions? If not, thank you so much. Thank you.